Are you guys exhausted by this point, or you're still <laughs> you still got still got the spirit? It's the morning, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> All right, like another hour. Or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I think that five o'clock will be there. <laughs> <laughs> zombie point. There is yeah. zombie yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. What, but the after the party, the <laughs> yes, after it. the party. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. the special guests for Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. So, most notably absent during this press session, uh, Joel Kinnaman, not here. <laughs> I'm not even going to pretend like I'm not upset about that. <laughs> so, what can you share about his character since he's not here to plug his right. lead role himself? Well, I, I will say he's not here, but I feel like physically I embody, <laughs> as you can tell. So, it's not much of an absence. Um, yeah, what can you say about this? I mean, Joel. Casting him was really one of the highlights of, of this process. He's one of these actors that, I don't know, there's something different about him. He's, I'm one, yes, he's beautiful, but I do think he's also got a charisma and sort of this dark side to him too that I think we wanted to embrace with this character. So this was a really difficult character to cast. We kind of, it took months, and the moment he became available, we just pounced and went after him. And his excitement for the show, as you'll see soon, um, is palpable, like it really did encourage us and help with our whole cast, our whole ensemble. I mean, there's a lot of actors in the show, um, and to have a, a guy like that be able to embrace that even ensemble helped with everything, so it was, it was, it was great. And his character really uh, embodies the, that sort of uh, prototypical astronaut of, the, of that era, you know, the sort of masculine aviator sunglasses, cor drives a fast Corvette, but a, a historical detail we discovered as we were developing the show um, helped us reframe him because we discovered that the Apollo 10 mission, uh, was, which was basically a dress rehearsal for the Apollo 11, it got almost all the way to the moon and they just didn't land. They just circled yeah. and came back. And we thought, well, if the Russians had beaten us to the moon, what would the feelings be about that crew that had almost done it? And if they had been able to go for it, how would, uh, you know, and, and so Joel is the commander of that mission and the sense of regret and, you know, uh, uh, the what if uh, of his character really drove his presence in the show. Can you tell us how did, how did the show come to be? How did this process start? It was just this magical moment. No, I'm kidding. It was, <laughs> it was, you know, we were developing with Ron. We were trying to find a project, and we were actually talking about doing a Western together at the time. <laughs> Western? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> we're obsessed with Westerns, and yeah. Ron is too, so we shared that. And as we were discussing that, this project, Ron had mentioned uh, that Apple's interested in doing a space show. And of course, Matt and I, we have a long history of obsession with NASA and the early days of NASA, and a lot of the stories and characters in NASA that are, have been forgotten by history. So we kind of started talking to him about it and he talked to us and the excitement of it led to um, a lot of what this show ended up becoming. So I think Apple being a service that's launching using this platform is almost the perfect fit. Um, and there, there was something about the show early on that there's a kismet to it. It just, it always made sense. It came together very easily, but it felt like the right time to do a show, an optimistic show about history. Um, and yeah, it's been a wild ride, honestly. Like I, it happened so fast. By the time we knew it, we were like had a thick lunar surface on a sound stage <laughs> with Joel Kinnaman in a spacesuit, and it was it was incredible. I mean, it's incredible to already be here and done with season one. So it's it's special. Yeah. And then going from the western to a space, and then realizing you have Ron D. Moore and Meryl Davis, that just was like. <laughs> yeah, it it was just uh, such a pleasure. It's the great pleasure of our, our career to work with them because it's just we we see things the same way and we have such a similar sensibility. And it's just been it's a rare thing to find uh, people you can work with that you just immediately get along with and um, and spur each other creatively. You know, yeah. I think uh, I don't know. It's just been great. Yeah, we, we've been fortunate in our career to work with really brilliant people. And we worked with Jason Kadims, Noah Hawley on Fargo for the whole run of that, which is incredible. <laughs> so Ron Moore, it was really this thing of like, oh my God, when we heard he wanted to work with us and we started meeting, it was that instant thing where all we could have talking about is history, you know, and like what happened in the past. So immediately we felt there's something here we can tap into. And I think television is a collaborative medium. And his openness, I mean, the guy has 
it speaks for itself his, his uh, path. So his openness to co-creating this with us um, and, and really involving us in every aspect of it was, has been incredible. He's been an incredible partner and Meryl too. I mean, their success speaks for itself, I think. So we're just trying to push ourselves through the door at this point. This is our first show we've created. So it is, it's a different experience for us. So. How is that journey been? Because you guys have done like Entourage, Fargo, Umbrella Academy, yeah. and now this is something, you know, very different. So yeah. how is that? Journey? There is space going on. Yeah. yeah. So there was yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a UFO <laughs> in Fargo. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's always yeah. been yeah. kind yeah. of through line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the UFO in Fargo. I'm so like, what? Yeah, we were that way too. Yeah. We're like, is it we were like, doing the UFO? Like, it was yeah. like a challenge. Let's just do it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just and throw the, it in there. And also the bowling alley in the season. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That was fun. No, it, it, I think it's interesting because as different as those shows are, there is a weirdness to all of them that I think yeah. we embrace in our <laughs> writing uh, a dark reality. Fargo, especially, I think Fargo was really the first show where we found our voice and said, this, okay. Because we started out in comedy and we never could find our feet in it. Fargo was a way for us to do a drama that had comedy in it. Um, and it spoke to us. And I think this show kind of takes that lesson as well. It's like, you know, there's so much TV right now. I think I remember in the Fargo room, the biggest insult you could, could give someone was, that sounds like TV. Um, and in this show, it's kind of continued, you know, where we challenge ourselves to break the mold of television and do something truly new and refreshing. And I think this yeah. show in ways that I'm still discovering it really has done that. I mean, it's a very different kind of show. Episode to episode changes dramatically. What you watch in the beginning of the season almost feels like a different show than what you see at the end of the season. So I'm very excited to see people's reactions as it, as it uh, unveils itself. So. Yeah, one of the things that I think is a through line of all the shows we've been a part of is that we really try to challenge the audience uh, and not uh, make the story expected or easy. Uh, and... Um, and this show also, I think it's it's uh, there's going to be a lot of unexpected uh, storytelling elements that will really make it interesting, and you have to really uh, be on the edge of your seat to, to follow along. So I think it'll be a lot of fun for people. Yeah, and like in Fargo, I think we love complicated characters. Yeah, we love this challenge of am I supposed to root for this person? Why am I rooting for this person? <laughs> Wait, what am I? You know, I think the question of did that really happen is another thing that I think our show embraces. <laughs> We don't spoon feed to the audience. We don't tell them, look, this is different. This is like we expect the audience. The audiences are so intelligent now, especially sci-fi audiences, that I know they'll do the research to see what is real and what isn't. And there's a lot of those Easter eggs throughout the show. So. With the logistics of creating an alternate history, are you making everything completely its own world? Or are you kind of trying to bring in things that still happened? Yeah. The history that we know. I mean, it was very important because we were asking the audience to buy into this alternate history that especially at the beginning of the show that, that we firmly planted it in reality as much as possible. So like we, we made, uh, we went to great lengths to make sure that everything in the space program that we were showing was as accurate as possible. Our, our mission control set is, is basically an exact replica of the mission control set. We had uh, Jerry Griffin, who was one of the flight directors from that time, come to the set and... Uh, he said it was almost exactly the same, except the ceiling tiles should have been more yellow from all the cigarette smoke that they that they had in the '60s. So, uh, did you repaint the ceiling? Then? <laughs> no, it was a little too late. We had continuity issues, but uh, it was a lot of fun to to really uh, be as accurate as possible. Are there plans for a second season? Uh, there are uh, hopes and and dreams and uh, <laughs> and we'll see. Yeah. And, uh, can you tell about meddling with the, one of the, as I think from my Polish perspective, one of the most important points in American history, something that defines so winning the race. When, from where did it came that it could be changed and that from what we hear it could be a good thing. That yeah, I mean like that's. Lost. One of our mantras on the show was by by losing we wind up winning. That it's it's uh, that victory was such an amazing iconic moment. But it actually after that point, because the Russians weren't able to to uh, follow our lead, everything all those plans just sort of petered out, and the and the competition that drove us to these great things uh, ended. And so our show is positing what if that competition kept going and. The Russians in the United States kept pushing each other to go further and further, and um, what would that look like? 